Pro Group Management. Workers' Comp that works for you. Welcome to Nevada Newsmakers on the broadcast today. The Democratic Chair of Senate Judiciary, Melanie Scheibel, here for the whole show on an all-new Nevada Newsmakers. Come join the month-long celebration during the Carson Valley Inn 13th Anniversary Giveaway with guaranteed $1,000 winners every drawing night and a $13,000 grand prize winner guaranteed. Come celebrate with us during the 13th Anniversary Giveaways at the Carson Valley Inn. Big R in Sparks is located on Bering Boulevard next to Smith's and across from Reed High School. It's a 50,000 square foot hardware store and a whole lot more. It's huge with clothing, power equipment, tools, and of course, hardware. Big R is located on Bering Boulevard in Sparks next to Smith's and opposite Reed High School. Big R, hardware and a whole lot more. The Nevada Builders Alliance has been protecting the interests of the construction industry for over 50 years. Our programs save members thousands of dollars every year and allow them to provide much needed benefits to their employees. Our industry also allows Nevada to grow. If you're thinking about a career in the construction industry, reach out. And if you haven't thought of a career in construction, what are you waiting for? We are the Nevada Builders Alliance. When in Carson City, Nevada Newsmakers records in the conference room at the Bank Saloon. Coverage of the 2023 legislative session is brought to you by Liberty Dental Plan, making members shine one smile at a time. Pro Group Management, workers' comp that works for you. The Regional Transportation Commission of Washoe County, your RTC, our community. NV Energy, proudly serving Nevada, providing electricity to 2.4 million electric customers. And by Nevada Builders Alliance, building a better Nevada. This is Nevada Newsmakers with host Sam Shad on No Holds Barred Political Forum. Now, from the Nevada Newsmakers broadcast headquarters, here is Sam Shad. And back on Nevada Newsmakers, coming to you from the Bank Saloon Conference Room in Carson City. We are delighted to be joined by State Senator Melanie Scheibel uh, of District 9. She is, this time around, co-majority whip, chair of Senate Judiciary, vice chair of Natural Resources, and a member of Commerce and Labor. You have come a long way since the teen edition of Nevada Newsmakers. <laughs> I have. I have. <laughs> um, let's start out with some basics. Um, what have the conversations been like with the governor and the governor's staff? So I've been really pleased that the governor made an effort to meet with every single legislator. Um, I had a nice conversation with him back in mid-March, and I think that we're all looking for places where we can find common ground, and how easy that will be remains to be seen. Um, well, the, the good thing is that this is a session where there's plenty of money as against where everybody's fighting over money or trying to raise it. Yes, yes. The, we do have a little bit more breathing room in the budget than we've had in previous sessions, certainly more than any of the previous sessions that I've been here. So I think that um, that definitely helps to ease some of the tension. Um, going to your natural resources hat, um, the overabundance of water from winter, which is wonderful in terms of we needed the water, uh, but there are benefits and detriments. What are you hearing so far? So I'm hearing a couple of different things. For one, the you know awesome snowpack up here in northern Nevada and in South Lake Tahoe doesn't necessarily translate to more water in the south where we need sure. it. Uh, the other issue that you run into is that a lot of water means a lot of growth over the um, over the summer and fall, which then in a couple more months turns into dry brush, which then creates a wildfire risk. So it's all you know trying to keep things in balance, but. Ultimately, we only have so much control of our nature. You know, it's funny. Um, I was a weatherman for 23 years, as you probably remember when you were growing up. And uh, it didn't matter whether it was a wet winter or a dry winter. You were always going to be dealing with the worst fire season ever. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's also true. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't really matter about that. Um, what water bills are coming down the pike for this session? So we have a couple of bills um, to deal with the water allocation, water shortages. One of the big things that we're trying to do that we've been working on for you know a couple sessions now is doing a better inventory of the water that we have in Nevada. You know, Nevada has groundwater, and then we also have subterranean water in the underground basins. And um, technology has developed a lot in you know the 200 years since we first started trying to allocate water, but 
you know, it's not like looking at a lake where you can measure down to the bottom of it and extrapolate how much water is in the lake. We need, you know, some more um, advanced scientific technology to try to assess how much water is underground. And so trying to get a more accurate assessment of our water inventory is part of the the challenge in, in you know the next few years. And of course in Nevada like many western states uh, there's been a great over allocation of water um, and now we're dealing with the reality and that goes for the Colorado River as well where the rules that were set down and the amounts that were given out were way over the actual capacity of the Colorado River. Um, from everything I'm reading it seems like uh, the Rockies are having a, a good winter and so we're going to see a rise in Lake Mead because of that. What else can you share with us about that? I mean, I agree. I think that we are lucky that there is some relief on the way just naturally with that additional water, that additional snowfall, but it doesn't change the fact that we have to be forward looking. And um, we also have great agencies here in Northern Nevada, Southern Nevada, throughout Nevada that have projected some of our possible water usages and possible water shortages. And so, um, you know, as policymakers, we're looking at sort of the best case scenario, worst case scenario, and most likely scenario and making decisions that hopefully encompass um, all, no decision can encompass all three of those, but the best we can do to ensure that whichever position we're in, we have enough water um, is what we're trying to do. Uh, Southern Nevada Water Authority still owns all those ranches in eastern Nevada. Um, what does that say to you about their future plans? You know, I, I think that we've discussed uh, some of their future plans in numerous sessions, and it looks like um, an idea to bring water from eastern Nevada down to southern Nevada is not very viable at this point. Um, and I'm not sure what their plans are. I know that when they presented to the Senate Committee on Natural Resources, their plans, you know, were limited to utilizing water from the Colorado River, from Lake Mead, um, and those, you know, southern Nevada sources to sustain the valley for the next 10, 20, even 30 years. Um, but as long as they hold on to those ranches, that means to me that the pipeline is really not dead at that point. But it could be, as you say, 30, 40 years out. You know, that's an interesting point, and um, I think that it, it merits some discussion, but, uh, you know, that's not for me to say. <laughs> okay. Um, Ivanpah Airport. Um, so Rosemary Vassiliadis, uh, who heads up the uh, Clark County Airport Authority, um, said that... Uh, uh, Harry Reid Airport is going to run out of space uh, by 2030, and yet Ivanpah uh, will not be ready to go until 2037. Has she made any presentations at this point to the legislature, or are you still waiting on that? You know, I don't sit on the Growth and Infrastructure Committee, um, so I've not had a conversation about the Ivanpah Airport yet, but certainly there are a lot of conversations going on in the building throughout the different committees and subcommittees and working groups. So um, it hasn't been something on my radar yet, but doesn't mean that people aren't working on it. Okay, but um, you know, as far as natural resources go, I mean, this would be will be a huge development, um, and so won't that at some point come under your jurisdiction? I think um, it would make sense absolutely for the Natural Resources Committee to weigh in to review some of the environmental impact reports, which I know have already been started or even completed, and that's been happening for 15 oh, yeah, years now. Yes. Yeah, so um, I think you know we'll, we'll definitely continue to be part of those conversations, but um, this legislative session, it hasn't been in the forefront. Uh, when I talked to Tick Segablum um, a couple of months ago, uh, when this first started coming really into the news again, um, he was saying that he doubted that there was a need for an additional airport for Las Vegas. Do you agree with that? I think I would need to see a little bit more of the data. Um, I can, you know, speak just anecdotally to my experience in the Las Vegas airport, which is that yes, it is crowded, and also uh, we do a great job of moving people from one, you know, point A to point B, and things run pretty smoothly. You know, you make it quickly through security at Las Vegas airport right now, but. Um, certainly the Transit Authority and other agencies would have better numbers on how many people are actually arriving and leaving Las Vegas every day, every month, every year. Um, and I know that there are you know, more airlines that are starting to fly in and out of Las Vegas. So that's another factor that, that we have to keep in mind. Do you think that there's any possibility that Las Vegas could go for seven years without any growth at the airport with the number of new casino hotel rooms that are coming on board? I'm really not sure. That's a little bit, you know, outside of my wheelhouse okay. and um, transportation logistics aren't 
my expertise, so I would rely on some more, um, some more knowledgeable people to advise me. All right, let's take a break. We'll come back more with Stacey and Melanie Scheibel after this timeout. Located in the heart of Carson City, the Bank Saloon is a historic watering hole with a modern feel. With a variety of classic cocktails featuring Nevada spirits, space for private events, conferences, and an incredible atmosphere, the Bank Saloon offers a great location to work and play. Come visit us. Located at the corner of 5th and Carson, we'll save you a drink. Lexus Cash and Free Play giveaways at Tamarack. Weekly Cash and Free Play winners plus a 20,000 cash winner guarantee. And drive home a brand new Lexus NX30 or walk away with 42,500 in cash. It's a good time to win at Tamarack Casino. As you know, Reno is booming. Toll's development company is helping it grow with insightful design and development, building community with every project, adding beauty, adding excitement, emphasizing our shared humanity. Reno is becoming bigger. Toll's development is helping it become better, more livable, more enjoyable. To learn more, go to tollsdevelopment.com, tollsdevelopment.com. Remember 2010 in Northern Nevada, 13 to 14% unemployment, thousands of homes in foreclosure, Nevada's casinos closing? Families in the Reno Sparks area were hurting. Many were losing everything. Then Story County launched a game changer for our region, a public-private industrial partnership, streamlined permitting slash bureaucracy, attracting Fortune 500 companies that made Nevada their home. Story County generated a river of cash to area communities. Economic studies by the state and others for the Gigafactory consistently show positive economic benefits for our region. Four billion in local wages, 17 billion in consumer spending and economic activity, over $100 million in taxes to Washoe, Story, Reno, Sparks, and Nevada, just for the Gigafactory alone. Story County, improving Northern Nevada one industry at a time. This is Nevada Newsmakers. And back on Nevada Newsmakers, we continue our conversation with State Senator Melanie Scheibel. Um, You've got SJR 7. It's a constitutional amendment on reproductive rights. Um, when one goes on the legislative website, that's what you get in terms of information about bills. Would you share with us a little about what that bill is all about? Absolutely. So um, we talked a lot about reproductive rights after the Dobbs decision came down uh, last year and um, recognized that Nevada has really been a leader in protecting everybody's right to choose. And that includes what we've termed a constitutional protection to the right to choose, which we, we say that because um, in 1990, the voters voted to implement a part of the statute, the Nevada Revised Statutes, that says that every person has the right to choose. And in order to repeal that, would take another vote of the people. Um, and that is enshrined in the Constitution. Um, so we, we say that we have a constitutional right to choose here in Nevada. And that's true. And yet we don't actually have a provision in the Constitution that protects the right to choose. And so what SJR 7 does is it strengthens that constitutional protection by actually inserting language into the Constitution that says that every person, regardless of their age, sex, gender, sexuality, gender identity or orientation, that they have the right to bodily autonomy and reproductive freedom here in the state of Nevada. So that when we say that we have a constitutionally protected right to choose, and a right to reproductive freedom in Nevada, we literally mean that it is in the Constitution. Okay, so this is a, you know, a carryover from what uh, Governor Sisolak uh, did as an executive order? So uh, there's a separate bill that kind of codifies uh, Governor Sisolak's executive order, and that's SB 131, which codifies the executive order that ensured that anybody who came to Nevada and access reproductive services here that they weren't able to access elsewhere would not be... Um, extradited, you know, re returned to another state um, by law enforcement officials to face criminal charges. Do, do, do you really think that that is something that is a reality? I think that it is something that other states are trying to do. Um, I think that it is important that we respond appropriately by providing those protections in law for people who come to the state of Nevada to seek reproductive health care. That is legal in Nevada. Um, 
Do you look at this and say um, that this should be a states' rights issue rather than a federal issue? That reproductive freedom mm -hmm. should be? Yeah. I really don't. Um, I think that every person, regardless of where they live, should have access to affordable health care and reproductive health care and the health care that they need. And I don't think that any state government or any politician should stand in a person's way. Does it concern you that the number of actual providers is so limited in the state of Nevada? Absolutely. And I think that um, as we work in Nevada to try to make it easier for providers to come here, it doesn't change the national landscape where it is still very difficult, very controversial, um, you know, very onerous to be a provider, especially of reproductive health care, but of health care at all. Um, to say the least. Um, another issue that you're working on is, uh, uh, well, I should ask you if you're working on, uh, which is uh, changes to the Speaker's Bill uh, for criminal justice reform. Um, there were several things that came up afterwards, and one of them uh, would obviously be retail crime, uh, which was not only a problem in Nevada, but a huge problem in California as well. Um, do you think that there are any changes that are going to come out of that um, during this session? Is that being discussed? You know, I don't think that there's so much uh, change to the Speaker's Bill as much as there are responses to the current state of affairs. And we're always looking at ways to improve our criminal justice system. As you mentioned, I chair a Judiciary Committee, so I am always involved in conversations about how we can keep communities safe and ensure that people are being treated fairly. And so um, we have been talking a little bit about organized retail crime. Um, and right now, I think we're still in a phase where we're trying to get better data. Um, it's been very interesting, especially as we've come out of the pandemic, to hear how people have certain perceptions about what the crime rate is like in their neighborhood or what kinds of crime are, um, you know, most affect them or most likely to affect them. Um, that is sometimes reflected in the statistical analyses that we can do with the, the data that we get, and sometimes it's not. And so trying to bear that out is part of the challenge in the legislative session. Are we in a better position uh, post-COVID than we were during COVID? I mean, I think we are in a better position in the sense that um, our law enforcement agencies are more readily able to address um, issues as they come up. They're able to put more people in the field. We have, um, you know, officers are able to make better contact with our community partners. Um, I think it was difficult for everybody when we were all very isolated, both literally and um, figuratively. Yeah, I mean, how, how bad was that for you? Because that, that was not your first session. Um, to be in a situation where you could not meet with lobbyists, you could not meet with the public? Yeah, uh, doing a session uh, almost entirely virtually was a challenge that I had never really anticipated. And it's amazing how much you lose in, in communication going to Zoom. Um, and I think that uh, I hope that years from now they will do studies on what our memory is like and um, human interactions and communications because. I found personally that um, my conversations and my meetings were less memorable, so I had to take more notes. I had to write things down just to remember, oh yeah, I did meet with that person. It was via Zoom and that's what we talked about, whereas during a normal session, I remember, oh yeah, we were standing in front of the water fountain, or we were standing in front of the gallery, or we were sitting in my office, and I'll remember a whole conversation much more clearly than the thousands that I had via Zoom. Are you concerned about the, the young people that are in their early 20s now that went through this horrible period of lack of social interaction and the problems that that may cause for them and perhaps society in general? I think that all of us had to endure the pandemic and I think it was difficult for people at every age um, for different reasons. And so um, I, I think that I'm no more concerned for, for the next generation coming up than uh, previous generations or, or the ones coming after them. You are an optimist. <laughs> All right, let's take a break. We'll be right back. Early in the morning or throughout the night, professional truck drivers are on the job, serving you, safely moving freight that's crucial to our economy. From the oldest industries to our newest innovators, from the exotic to the everyday, Trucks are everywhere, moving everything. Never afraid to embrace a future that makes Nevada and our nation stronger. Trucking moves America forward. 
Pro Group Management is the place where companies can find workers' comp solutions that are designed to meet their specific business requirements. As regulations evolve, Pro Group takes a proactive approach to clear the path to make sure your business stays ahead of the curve. Knowing your workers' comp program is optimized, you can focus on other important matters related to your growing business. Pro Group Management, workers' comp that works for you. Like a traditional handmade basket, retail is woven into the fabric of life in Nevada. From big box to mom and pop, retail supports our communities in countless ways. Jobs for the disabled, team uniforms for kids, help for the elderly, and so much more. Retail employs over 1 in 10 workers. Retail supports Nevada, and we support retail. R-A-N-N-V dot org. Hi, I'm Renee Summer, our digital news anchor here at 7 at 7. Watch our streaming nonstop newscast immediately with your mobile phone. 7 at 7 is the new way for you to get every bit of local news you need in just seven minutes. Breaking news, local neighborhood news, weather and sports are just a click away. Reporters bring you all of what's happening in the valley from Roku, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, YouTube and more. Get every bit of local news you need from the RJ and LVRJ.com. This is Nevada Newsmakers. And back on Nevada Newsmakers, we continue our conversation with Democratic State Senator Melanie Scheibel. We have so many things. You're going to have to come back because I've got a much longer list here. SB, um, SB 163 requires certain health insurance to cover treatment of certain conditions relating to gender dysphoria, gender incongruence, and other disorders of sexual development. Please explain. So this is legalese to say that SB 163 prohibits health insurance providers from discriminating against people on their plans based on their gender identity or gender expression. So we're talking about ensuring that everybody has access to gender affirming care, whether they're cisgender, transgender, gender non-binary, or gender non-conforming. Okay, but, but what, what does that literally mean? So that means, and I'll give you one of my favorite examples, is that um, uh, we think of cisgender men, you know, men who have body parts that we associate with men who need a prostate exam every year. Well, there are some women, transgender women, who still need a prostate exam every year uh, for their health to ensure that they don't develop cancers. But some insurance companies may deny a prostate exam for a person whose health insurance documentation reflects that they're a woman. So what SB 163 does is it says that any services that you provide on your plan, you have to provide to people regardless of their gender or gender identity, or if a medical professional says that it's medically necessary for them. So it could be something like a prostate exam. It could be something like um, hormone treatment or hormone therapies that we already make available to women, cisgender women who are going through menopause, but that um, trans men or trans women may also want. Um, and so the, the purpose of the bill is to ensure that everybody on their health insurance plan is able to receive the care that their doctors, it's not elective, it's not you know pick and choose from a menu, it's if your doctor says that this is medically necessary for you, um, then the health insurance plan has to cover it. Um, do you feel that as we were in the 70s, uh, late 60s and into the 70s, that we are going through a sexual revolution in this country? I'm not sure that we are. Um, and I also am not sure that you know equating sex and gender is always the right way to go because um, we're seeing with people who are struggling with their identities or, or you know, coming into their gender identities that sometimes it is uh, very separate from their sexual orientation or identity. Um, it is more about how this person feels in their own body, um, the, the kinds of the, the way that they want to move through the world, the way they want to be seen, and not just in a sexual way, but in a professional way, in a platonic way, with friends and family. You know, they want to be seen and treated um, as the gender that they, that they know they are internally. Um, do you think the majority of the population understands this? I don't. I think that the majority of the population, um, especially in Nevada, wants to be accepting and wants to be compassionate, but there's definitely a gap in, in understanding. And, and what, what, what steps can be taken 
to help people understand this so that it's, it's not such a big issue because it's, it's very confusing to a lot of people. I think it is really confusing to a lot of people and I think that it is on, um, you know, th this group we call ourselves allies, you know, cisgender people to continue to talk about gender identity and to continue to bring our friends and family into those conversations. I think uh, what is not appropriate is to put all of the burden on people who are trans or gender nonconforming to educate the public. It's important for those of us who have that, you know, one degree of separation to take a minute out of our day. And when we hear somebody, you know, making an inaccurate statement or claim about transgender people to say, hey, actually, this is, you know, what, what is more likely going on, or this is a more common understanding, or this is um, a more appropriate way to, to discuss this issue. Um, one last question here, and a quick answer, please. Okay. Um, are we going to see Death with Dignity pass, the, the new version of it, uh, pass through the houses this year? I am actually not sure. I, 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 I don't know. Um, you have no feeling towards this? It, I, I mean, with the different chairman of the committee, um, it seems like there's a better possibility now that Joe Hardy is mayor of Boulder City. It does seem like it, it has gotten further, um, but something that I think maybe people don't realize with a lot of these really deeply personal issues is that um, we have, my colleagues and I have a lot of respect for differing opinions, and so we don't necessarily come in day one and pull everybody on where they are. Um, you know, these conversations develop over time. Um, and I know I've had conversations with the bill sponsor about it. I know that my colleagues have, but it's not something that I, I couldn't tell you where every member of the legislature stands on it. All right. Well, we are inviting you back to come back on the program before the end of session. Okay. So perhaps you'll have more answers for us then. Thank you so much for taking the time. And some of these are very difficult issues, but we appreciate your opinion. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll be right back. What do you count on? You count on your power every day. At NV Energy, we've always powered what's important to you. But we're not looking at the past. We're focused on the future. While our standards are high, our rates will remain low. And our commitment to renewables isn't just meeting standards, but leading the way. Because you can count on more than just your power. You can count on the company who brings it to you. That's our promise. You can count on it. When in Carson City, Nevada Newsmakers records in the conference room at the Bank Saloon. Coverage of the 2023 legislative session is brought to you by Liberty Dental Plan, making members shine one smile at a time. Pro Group Management, workers' comp that works for you. The Regional Transportation Commission of Washoe County, your RTC, our community. NV Energy, proudly serving Nevada, providing electricity to 2.4 million electric customers. And by Nevada Builders Alliance, building a better Nevada. Our thanks to the Bank Saloon in Carson City and the Builders Alliance for their help with our coverage of the 2023 legislative session. We'll see you on the next broadcast.